fun. Our first speaker is Tim Maudlin. Tim is a professor of philosophy at NYU, New York University. He taught at Rutgers University for a quarter of a century before moving to NYU in 2011. He is the author of Quantum Non-Locality and Relativity, Truth and Paradox, Solving the Riddles, The Metaphysics Within Physics, and Philosophy of Physics, Space and Time. He has been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a member of the Academy International de Philosophy de Sciences and the Foundational Questions Institute, as well as a participant in the Rutgers Templeton Project in Philosophy of Cosmology. Let's welcome Tim as he comes. So, okay, there we go. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I should thank the organizers for having us and all of you for being here. Um, I have been was, was up this morning thinking about, I've written a paper, I'm going to sort of give some of it, I guess, but, but uh, I went to a friend's school, and uh, the Quakers have silent meeting, and you, everyone sits quietly unless you're moved by the spirit, and if you're moved by the spirit, you get up and speak. And um, although I wasn't a Quaker, I took that quite seriously into heart when I was in school and I would be moved by the spirit and get up and say things. It got me into a little bit of trouble sometimes. So I figure I'm here in a chapel. Uh, I'm going to sort of give a sermon, I suppose, and maybe it'll get me into some trouble. Um, Dr. Kelly yesterday said, which I think made us all feel very good, that the purpose of this is to seek the truth with an open mind. And it's worthwhile reflecting what a truth-seeking enterprise looks like if you have an open mind, or if the enterprise has an open mind, to be a little more precise. Um, it's a hard thing to do. To seek something, you have to begin by realizing you don't know it and to be prepared to accept whatever you find. And I think it's fair to say most people just aren't in that situation. And most scientists aren't either. I'm not making, I mean, I deal a lot with scientists. And if you ask me, are they people who readily give up their beliefs? The answer is no. Do they give up their beliefs when you present them with absolutely irrefutable arguments? No. They don't. Right? Human psychology isn't like that. But, and, and the overall idea, though, of, of seeking the truth with an open mind, I guess, has always been, I feel, what motivated me. When I was an undergraduate, I did a, a, a joint degree in physics and philosophy because I thought both of those disciplines were aimed at fundamental truth, seeking it with an open mind. Now, if you ask me why, what enterprises, if individuals have a very hard time doing this, what enterprises seem to work well? It seems as though science does a very good job at this. So someone, I wish I could remember who made the observation, which seems to me quite profound, that here's a difference between scientific belief and religious belief in terms of space and time. Scientific belief tends to be uniform over space and vary through time. That is, if you go all around the world and ask bio, biologists biological questions or physicists physics questions, you'll get pretty much the same range of opinions at any given time. But if you go back 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 200 years, radical differences. And religious belief seems to be static over time and divided over space. Right? So if you go to certain regions of the world, ge geographical regions, you will have the same religious beliefs that have been there forever, more or less, conflicting with each other. And why is that? Well, the, the normal story, and I think the true one, is because scientific beliefs are responding to evidence, because there's data coming in, because people, 
the enterprise as a whole, even if it's made up of all these individuals with their very strongly held individual beliefs, the enterprise as a whole somehow is able to overturn even very deeply held beliefs on small levels and large levels. We stopped taking multivitamins about a year ago, having been told through our entire lives, take your multivitamins, they make you healthy. <laughs> Right? Take your vitamins every day. Take your vitamins every day. And then what did we do? We read, opened up the newspaper and we said there's been a long-term longitudinal study, which is a hard thing to do, follow a lot of people over a long period of time and see, does taking the vitamins really help? Answer, it doesn't. We thought it did, it doesn't. We stopped buying them. That's, I think, seeking the truth with an open mind. Now, I have to say, how do you do that? The format last night, the forensic format, 18 minutes, eight minutes response, is sort of fun. It's not something you ever do as a philosopher. It's not something you ever do as a physicist. It's not, I don't think it's the right way, actually, to seek the truth. It's enjoyable. Um, I, I guess you might, after, you might ask who won the debate last night by asking people, but the question you'd ask is, who do you think was right? That's the wrong question. The question should be, did anybody change their mind? In some sense, if nobody did, nobody won the debate, or the debate didn't move things forward. Now, I'm sure nothing I'm going to say today will really have any different effect. It would be very hard to do so. But I think it's worth reflecting how difficult it is to seek the truth with an open mind. Let me try and now actually get to my, my paper. I want to start by talking about two different questions. The first question is, why are we here? In the sense, why are we gathered here in this chapel on this Saturday morning to talk about cosmology and God? It's an interesting topic if you think about it. It seems natural, cosmology and God, but in another sense, it seems kind of unnatural. Uh, why not macroeconomics in God, or synaptic neurons in God, or the electrical conductivity of carbon nanotubules in God? Um, take a scientific topic and then put and God, and you might wonder, well, there is a science of cosmology. There's a lot of cosmological knowledge we have acquired. A tremendous amount, and a tremendous amount over the last 20 years. I mean, if you look at our understanding of, of the universe as a whole, so cosmology is the study of the physical universe at the largest scales of space and time. If you think about what we have learned, the amount of knowledge we've acquired in our lifetime sitting in this room vastly outweighs the accumulated knowledge of mankind over all of human history. So if you were interested in cosmology as such, if you wanted to know what is the world like, what is the physical world we live in like at cosmological scale, we know much, 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 much more. And if you were interested in that, quite honestly, if that's what you were interested in, that part of it, I don't know that you, I don't think you'd be here because you'd be at a cosmology conference or you'd be at a planetarium. There's a lot of very interesting things that we found out. Most of what we found out, almost none of what we found out actually was even talked about last night. Last night was almost entirely focused on stuff we still don't know, which is curious because what we have found out is very interesting. But why that topic? Why are we here with that topic? Well, there's another question, which I take it is on many people here's minds in the background. Why are we here? as people. What is the purpose of our life? What is the meaning of our life? What is the meaning of human existence? Does it have in it? How should we act? What is right? What is wrong? What is virtue? What is vice? And I take it that many people think Answers to the questions of the cosmos, what is the nature of the cosmos, have some bearing on that larger question. And that's why people are here. So the second question about purpose, about meaning, where do we fit in to the universe? Right? I think that's the subterranean question 
that's motivating people to be here, even though it's not really our, hasn't been our direct topic, but I think it's why people are here. You have often subterranean motivations for things that don't get spoken about, and I want to try and dig this one up and talk about it directly and talk about the bearing of cosmology on that question, and even broader, the bearing of theology on that question. Because I think the, the links for most people here is that maybe there's a bearing of cosmology on theology, and there's a bearing of theology on this larger question. Okay. Uh, does the cosmos as we find it seem to have a, a, a purpose, an end, or a meaning? Now, I, I want to go quickly through two quotes. One is, is, often, uh, is from Galileo, and it's often repeated incorrectly as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven and not how the heavens go. The actual quote, and it wasn't by Galileo, he, 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 by a marginal notation of someone named Cardinal Baronius apparently said it. it, was the intention of the, this is a translation, the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. Okay, so there shouldn't, you shouldn't look to scripture for cosmological answers. Uh, so there ought to be a separation between science and a certain questions. So that's one thought that has been around. And there's another thought about the effect of studying the cosmos. So there's a, a famous quote from Steven Weinberg who said after many years of studying the cosmos, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. That the effect of looking at the cosmos, of looking at it in its face and seeing what it's like is to make you feel as though there is no purpose, there is no meaning. And that would upset people and maybe turn them emotionally against cosmology. You could understand that. But I think that's the wrong reaction. I want to talk about why that's the wrong reaction. So right now I've introduced four little players. Well, let me before I go there. There are obvious, if we ask of scripture, what is cosmology? What is the structure of the universe? We can get answers if we read it literally. And we know what those answers are, at least certain scriptures, Bishop Usher did a famous calculation and would tell us that the whole universe was just over 6,000 years old and so on. We know those answers are incorrect. They're just wrong, factually incorrect. So we have now four players. We have scientific cosmology, the study of the cosmos by scientific methods. We have scripture, which contains in it some cosmological claims, if you read it literally. We have theology, which is the study of God or arguments pertaining to the existence of God. And we have the issue, this larger issue sitting in the background of meaning and morality, of the good, of the purpose or value of our lives and our actions. And I want to talk about the relations between these. I don't think the relations between these are well understood. I think they're the opposite of what many people think. So what are the relations among these? There are some relations. One relation is the one I just said. Scientific cosmology flatly contradicts scriptural accounts of the cosmos if you interpret them literally. That's just, you can't make that go away. Um, of course, they thought scripture told us the earth is at rest at the center of the universe, and Galileo got into a lot of trouble for defending Copernicanism because of that. And that was why Galileo wanted to separate scripture from cosmology. Of course, Galileo was doing it to save his own skin, but it, it, the better thing was that the, the, the church should want to do that too, right? Because if you say, I have to believe that the earth is at rest at the center of the universe to believe scripture, then what we know is that the scripture is incorrect. We found that out. So that's just a flat contradiction. Does scientific cosmology have any bearing at all on theology? If so, what is that bearing? That's a question we have. Does scientific cosmology have any bearing at all on questions of meaning and morality and the value of our lives? If so, what is that bearing? That's a good question. And then this question, which will probably surprise you, but is going to be a lot of what I'm going to talk about. Does theology have any bearing on the question of meaning or morality? Because it's sort of taken for granted that it does. But there's a long philosophical tradition that says that it doesn't. 
And I think that the arguments of that tradition are correct. So if we, I want to leave scripture out of this because it's no point beating up on scriptural cosmology. If, if, if that were an issue and if you think there's an issue there that maybe the universe really is 6,000 years old, maybe the earth really is at the center, maybe the earth doesn't really rotate on its axis and so on, then there's nowhere to begin a useful conversation in this room. So I'm going to... So now we have reduced caste. I'm going to get rid of scripture. We've got scientific cosmology. We have natural theology. So I want to restrict theology to natural theology. That is, arguments pertaining to the existence of God or a godlike entity that rest on natural science, that rest on observation. So I'm going to leave aside there have been in the tradition logical arguments that purport to prove the existence of God, uh, like the ontological argument and so on. But these are supposed to be ones that rest some of their premises on the results of science. And we have the third thing, meaning and morality, or the good. I still want to talk about that. So what is the aim of natural theology? It's to argue from the perceptible features of the physical world to some sort of godlike entity. And I'm going to be very careful about my words here. What, are the what could one in principle conclude from natural theology if it worked in the best way it could possibly work? So that's the aim, is to look at the world and to reason from it to some sort of godlike entity. How godlike? What, in what way godlike? Well, that depends on the argument. So one thing you cannot do legitimately, logically, is say, here's an argument to a kind of godlike entity. Therefore, it's an argument for the entity I believe God to be. Right? I believe in a God, which presumably has some very specific characteristics. Here is an argument that some god or other exists, therefore that argument supports my belief in my god. No, you have to ask what is actually established by the argument. If one starts from natural science and observation, might one, one might well wonder how could any moral properties of God, and if those are the ones you're interested in, how could any moral properties even possibly be established by this argument? I'm going to claim they can't be, irrespective of how well the argument works otherwise. So, first question, do any of the features of the observable cosmos suggest that there's a divinity or a godlike creature? Okay. There are two main lines of argument we've talked about. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. First cause arguments and fine-tuning arguments. We heard about these last night. But um, what's the status of those? What about first cause arguments? Well, they seem to depend on the idea that establishing by observation and then theorization that the universe, the physical universe, has only existed for a finite period of time. Have we been able to establish that? The answer is no. The answer is science is not yet at a point where it can even sensibly address that question. It's not that science tells you or even plausibly suggests one thing or another. Because science has established lots of things with very high degrees of plausibility based on direct observation, right? The big telescopes and everything. But it's only theory that could get us from what we can observe, which takes us back to shortly after the Big Bang. That can take us back 13 billion years. But observation cannot take us back before then. There's, nothing, the, the, there, there's no observable features that are records earlier than that. What has to take you earlier than the so-called Big Bang, if there is anything earlier than the Big Bang, is theory. And theory is not yet in place. It's not established that's capable of doing that. Now, Sean gave you a list of a lot of people who are trying, but that's what they're doing. They're trying. We heard a lot about the BGV theorem and this theorem, that theorem. None of these theorems, they're pieces of mathematics. They have no bearing on this question because they all have presuppositions in them, mathematical presuppositions, which 
we have no plausible reason to believe would hold early in the universe. So for the math fans of you out there, the BGV theorem, some other theorems, they all begin, the first line is take a four-dimensional manifold, okay? So that's a, a, a hypothesis already about the nature of space and time, that it's a four-dimensional manifold. That's a very substantial hypothesis, and almost any physicist would say, that's probably not true. If we take quantum mechanics into account, at the end of the day, it doesn't seem very likely space-time is going to be a four-dimensional manifold. If that's right, all of those theorems are pretty much irrelevant. You can't draw any consequences from them at all. I, I, you know, if, if you're under, I mean, I don't want to go into a lot of technical detail here because I don't think any of your own beliefs actually rest on your understanding of the BGV theorem or anybody in this audience says, you know, if only the issues about Boltzmann brains come out this way rather than that way, I'll change my mind. You know, I don't think that's really what's on your mind. I'm trying to address what I think is really on your mind. What about the fine-tuning arguments? So people say, well, uh, the universe seems to be fine-tuned for life because there are all these constants of nature, and if you set them slightly differently, you couldn't have life. How well do we understand that? Well, not well at all. We don't know how many of the things we think of as constants of nature are really constant. That is absolutely constant. They could be values that change through time, but have settled down to fairly constant values here. They could be things who ha that have different values and in some of these bubble universe scenarios, they take on different values in different regions of the universe. And there's, in string theory, there are claims that this naturally arises from some theoretical considerations. I could say that and then you could say, but how well established is string theory? And I'd say, it isn't. I think Sean, who's a big fan of string theory, would have to admit it isn't. This is not something you can rest a strong belief in. So we don't even know what are the constants of nature. We don't know how many they are. We don't know how many of the things we think of as independent constants of nature might really be connected by underlying law, so they're not really independent. There seem to be too many of them. I mean, one thing physicists complain about is that when you list what seem to be the independent constants of nature, there just is a big pile of them, and they think, no, nah, that seems too complicated. Maybe as we progress forward in our understanding, we'll see there aren't so many. Uh, it's not known whether there are these different regions of the universe where the things we take to be constants are different. So the fine-tuning arguments are not in good shape. But more importantly, suppose I even granted that, yes, the, 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 we know the constants and they're somehow fine-tuned. Could I tell by looking at that what they were fine-tuned for? So it wasn't even granted you they were fine-tuned by an agent intentionally. Some agent picked them. Could you tell me why that agent picked them as they are? Now, people often say, look, they're fine-tuned for life, which suggests that the agent wanted to create life. But if you were to ask, how would the universe have to be fine-tuned to make volcanoes? Okay, not life, just volcanoes. Suppose you had an agent who was interested, didn't care at all about life, but wanted volcanoes. You know, there has to be a lot of stuff to go on for there to be volcanoes. There has to be rocks, and there have to be planets, and the planets have to have certain masses, so they heat up the, the, and melt the rocks, and it all comes up. You know, it's a complicated gadget, a volcano. And you would find there's a lot of those constants of nature. You could say, you know, they're fine-tuned for volcanoes. They're fine-tuned for earthworms. You could ask, how fine-tuned does the universe have to be for me, personally, me, for me to exist? The universe could be different in a lot of different ways where I don't exist, right? It's the, not just the constants of nature, but a whole lot of very fine detail has to have gone a very particular way for me to be standing here in front of you today. To conclude from that, that the universe was fine-tuned for me, that that's the explanation of all this. It had to go this way to get me here now. That would be not very reasonable. So I don't, even if you could get to a, an intelligent agent picking these constants, I don't think you'd get to why they were picked, okay? Um, so let's suppose natural theology works. 
Let's suppose, actually, I don't think any of the arguments do work, but suppose it did, what would we get out of it? Suppose we got the idea that, there, that the, the, the constants were picked by some intelligent agent, that our physical universe was created by some intelligent agent. That's consistent with the following story that you'll hear in science fiction, that we are all living in a virtual reality, right? We are all living in a computer program. And that computer program was created by, let's say, a ninth grade student in a fairly advanced computer class in some universe. And he was given an assignment, which was take these laws, like more or less like general relativity and quantum mechanics, with these constants open and find some constants that would give rise to a kind of interesting universe. Okay? Maybe that's the universe we're living in. If you got that conclusion, the point I want to say is the theological arguments, these arguments that derive from Aquinas, that say, well, then there is a first cause and we call that cause God. Or there was someone who, picked, who, who intentionally picked these constants and that being we call God. Well, if the constants were picked by some kid, I don't call that God. Right? That agent that, that has the properties that natural theology could assign to it would not have any interesting moral properties. Suppose, it, suppose scientists found this out. I mean, here's, so here's the deep question I want to ask you. Suppose we found this out. Suppose science discovered that we are living in a computer. We are actually living inside a very fancy computer. Okay? And establish this to whatever degree of likelihood you like. And it's all over the newspapers, right? Universe, big computer. We are living in simulated reality. Our creator got a B plus on his project. Okay? Nobel Prize is all around. Would that change to any degree at all questions of the value of your life, the meaning of your life, what's right and what's wrong. I claim it just wouldn't. It has no bearing. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, does not come with a little additional rider that says void if you happen to be living inside a computer. Right? It would be a very interesting physical discovery about the world. It would have no moral consequences. Okay, so Suppose we could figure out for sure that, that these constants were picked by some intelligent agent. We couldn't figure out why. Look at the universe. Look at, think of the picture Sean showed us of the universe that was created. One thing we know beyond any reasonable doubt was that that universe was not created for us. We know what a universe created for us would look like. That's what scripture tells us. It would be a universe with the earth at the center. It would be a universe where pretty much everything there had some direct bearing on the Earth. It would not be a universe filled with billions and billions and billions of stars and galaxies spread out as far as the eye can see, where we're on the outer edge of one particular pinwheel galaxy going around. People who wrote scripture knew what that kind of God, a God creating the universe for us, they knew what that kind of God would do. That's why they had a cosmology in scripture. But that's not, that cosmology is just untrue. And it, it may be hard to accept that untruth if you were attached to that scripture, but life is hard. And if you want to seek the truth with an open mind, you have to say, the world isn't like that. So, I gave you my science fiction example, sorry. And if we, if we go through that, and that's what a natural theological argument, that's the best it could do. I'm giving you your best result from natural theology. I'm granting you that you're getting a first cause that is in some sense transcendental, that is, is not part of the physical universe we live in, and the first cause is an intentional agent, and the first cause picked these constants intentionally for some purpose, I'm granting you all that, you still don't get any 
any of the other stuff you thought was important. Okay, so the answer to, the, to, to, to what difference would all this make if we found that out is not, not much. Suppose you found out the desires of the creator. Suppose you found out there was a creator and the creator had desires and ends. The creator created us and this universe for a purpose. We exist for a purpose. Would that help the issues of meaning of my own life? Again, I think the answer, the straightforward answer is just no. Let me give you another example. I have two people, mid-level mid chess players, and they want more than anything else to have a child who's the world chess champion. And they intentionally decide, we're going to have a child and train them to play chess. They only have the child for that purpose. The child is born from the beginning, the child is given chess lessons and so on, becomes very good at chess, very good. And at age 18 is getting ready to go compete for the world chess championship, but this girl, this brilliant chess player, finds chess pointless, boring uninteresting, unfulfilling, it's just a game. Does it help that she was intentionally created for this purpose by her parents? It doesn't help her. She might feel obligated somehow to go through with it because of her parents, but it still doesn't give her life any significance, lived from the inside. Why should it? And I'm, I, I, the same goes for God. If, if there is a God that created this universe for some purpose, and even if I can figure out that purpose, does that mean I have to adopt that purpose or that purpose invest my life with meaning? Why should it? There's a logical gap there. It's not one that people talk about much. They think, if I can just get myself to some kind of God, I'll get all the other things I want. They don't necessarily follow. Right? Should we have to serve a creator's desires? Is that the best way to live? Not necessarily. I just gave you an example where it isn't. Now, that might seem a little depressing. You say, look, even God can't give my life meaning. Maybe God, maybe if there's a God, God finds God's own life meaningless and pointless. Right? Why am I here? What's the point of this? So you might say, that's really depressing. I can't get meaning no matter what. Even give me a God, I can't give you meaning. No, let's look at the flip side. The flip side is much better. The flip side says, but that means if your life has meaning, if your life has purpose, if there is right and wrong, if there is good and bad, it doesn't depend on God. It's independent. Even if there's no God, your life still has meaning. Even if there's no God, there's still right and wrong. Even if there's no God, there's still purpose and value. That's just the opposite. It's once you separate these things, there's an optimistic side to it. And that optimistic side says, maybe the universe as a whole is meaningless. Maybe Reinberg was right. The universe wasn't created for any purpose, by anybody, for any end. It does not follow that our lives do not have purpose, or meaning, or value. And I think it's because people think that follows that they get upset about cosmology. They look at the universe and they say it's a big place and it's full of all this stuff and all that stuff doesn't have much to do with us. That's the way it is. You just have to accept that. That's the way it is. Does that mean my life is meaningless? Why should it? If I don't have to, if the desires and intentions of the creator don't have to give my life meaning, even if there's no creator, that doesn't mean my life is meaningless. Now, this argument goes back over 2,000 years to a dialogue called Euthyphro written by Plato. And I think, Euth I think Plato wrote the last word on this topic 2,000 years ago. I think he was right. I think this is a good argument. And I just want to remind you, if you haven't read it or tell you if you have, what Euthyphro argues. So in the dialogue, Socrates asks Euthyphro, Euthyphro is really sure he knows the right thing to do. If you don't, haven't read the the, the dialogue, Euthyphro is, has brought his own father to trial for murder because he behaved in a way that, that led to the death of a slave. 
And nobody in Athens thought he did anything wrong because the slave had killed somebody else and he tied him up. It's a, anyway, nobody else in Athens thought this man should be prosecuted, but his own son did. Euthyphro did. Euthyphro was the one guy who would take his father into court. And Socrates says, Euthyphro, you must really understand right and wrong, piety and impiety. If you're so sure that you know what's right, that you're willing to do this thing that no other Athenian will do, you must know what piety is. And Euthyphro says, I certainly do, Socrates. And Socrates, of course, says, please teach me. I don't know. It, it's that Socratic dialogue is the right way to do philosophy, by the way, not 18 minutes, okay? Socratic dialogue, discussion. And Socrates says, so Euthyphro, teach me. What is the pious? And Euthyphro says, the pious is what the gods, he says the gods, of course he was a polytheist, the pious is what the gods love. Now, as a polytheist, and particularly as a Greek polytheist, there was a little difficulty with that answer because the Greek gods were notoriously in disagreement among themselves about what to do. So what one god loved, the other god hated. So that left you in a bit of a quandary about what to do. But Socrates clears that aside and he says, look, let's suppose all the gods agree, or let's suppose there's only one god, so disagreement doesn't come into it. Is the pious still what the gods love? Now, Socrates grants that anything all the gods love is pious. It's the right thing to do. So that's, as it were, what we would call in philosophy a materially correct definition for those of you doing philosophy. But he asks a deeper question of Euthyphro. He says, but look, is it God's loving it that makes it right or is it being right that makes God to love it? What explains what? What's the cause and what's the effect? Now, you, you have to see the importance of this question. If it is God loving it that makes it right, then if there is no God, there is no right and wrong, right? Because if there is no God, then God, there's no God to love anything. But if it's the other way around, if it's being right is what makes God love it, then the real issue is what's right. Now, the notion that God's a kind of divine command theory, that what makes something right is God's approval, leads you to a very strange and I think bizarre situation. It suggests that God can't have any reasons for approving of things, can't have moral reasons for approving of things. It's as if in trying to write down the Decalogue, God comes to the first thing and he says, well, not the first thing, I'll go later on. I could write down thou shalt not steal or I can write down thou shalt steal. But before I approve of one or the other, there's no right or wrong. I can't make that decision on the basis of what's just or unjust, what's fair or unfair, what's good or bad. There is no good or bad until I decide. But that means God's decision would have to be arbitrary. We don't think that. Nobody thinks that. I certainly don't think that. I don't believe in any God, but I know that murder is wrong. I know that slavery is wrong. I know there is there are objective standards of right and wrong and good and bad. They're hard to find out. You have to think hard. You have to investigate. You have to be open to discovering that things you thought all your life were right are wrong and things you thought all your life were wrong aren't wrong. And that's hard to do. But what Socrates concludes is that the only way this makes sense is that What's right is right in its own nature. And God can at best recognize the right, but can't make things right. And that means it would continue to be right whether or not God even exists. 
So this is what I wanted to say. The, the connection, there's a connection, question of a connection between cosmology and theology, and there's another question, what is the connection between theology and meaning and morals? And I don't think there is much of one. And maybe if, we, if, if one were to accept that, it would remove, so getting to the morals of my sermon, what are the morals? Let the cosmologist try to figure out the cosmology without worrying about the moral consequences, because there aren't any. If you're interested in the cosmos, if you're really interested in cosmology, study cosmology. It's an interesting topic. There's a lot of knowledge that, again, we didn't focus on the knowledge. We focused last night on the unknowns. You want to worry about Boltzmann's brain? That's fine. I worry about Boltzmann's brains, but that's because I'm a philosopher. If you're interested in morality, then think hard and clearly about justice and equity. Clear moral principles. How do they apply? What's fair? What's unfair? And if you're interested in theology, that's fine. Nothing in cosmology, at yes, I think, suggests there is a God. Um, cosmology does, in fact, refute scripture if you interpret it literally. So if you're going to do that, take the cosmology seriously. You're going to have to give up some of your scripture. But I think theological conclusions in either direction actually don't shed light on moral questions. And if we were to realize that, it might remove some of the friction between the scientific community and the religious community, which I think shouldn't exist. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Tim Maudlin poses two questions. First, the practical question, why are we here? And second, the existential question in capital letters, why are we here? The answer to the practical question is obvious. We're here to discuss the topic of God and cosmology. But the second question is an irrelevancy to this year's forum. We are not here to discuss why we are here. Questions of Old Testament ethics, biblical reliability, the Euthyphro dilemma, the meaning of life, are all red herrings threatening to distract our attention from the topic of this year's forum. The independence of these issues from the topic at hand is evident from the fact that Maudlin seeks to demonstrate not so much the irrelevance of cosmology to the existence of God, but rather the irrelevance of the existence of God to questions of meaning and value. I, along with many other Christian philosophers and theologians, have addressed those questions elsewhere, and I'll refer you to that work. But today, I refuse to follow the hounds in feverish pursuit of these red herrings, but will remain resolutely fixed upon our quarry, which is the implications of contemporary cosmology for the existence of God. Fortunately, Professor Maudlin does have some things to say of relevance to this question. Consider first the Kalam cosmological argument. Dr. Maudlin rightly points out that because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we cannot provide a physical description of the universe prior to the Planck time. But from this, he too hastily concludes that therefore we do not have good evidence that the universe began to exist. Charles Misner once remarked to me, that is, it is as if a tiny window shade were drawn across the first split second of the universe's existence so that we cannot yet describe what is going on behind the shade. Nevertheless, he insisted, we know that it doesn't come out on the other side. As I explained yesterday, the BGV theorem gives us good grounds for thinking that classical space-time began to exist and the Wall theorem gives us evidence that the universe began to exist even with a quantum gravity era. So whether with the boundary of classical space-time or with the quantum gravity era, the universe probably began to exist. Turn now to the teleological argument based on the fine-tuning of the universe. Here I think it's important to clear up a confusion. It is no part of the fine-tuning argument to assert that the reason or purpose for which the universe exists is me. 
As I explained last night, there may be embodied conscious agents suffused throughout the universe. Uh, there's no reason to think from the fine-tuning argument that the universe was designed uh, for human beings. Now, you'll recall that the fine-tuning concerns both physical constants and arbitrary physical quantities. Here, Dr. Maudlin complains that what appear to us as constants may well not, from a truly universal standpoint, be constant at all. And he gives the example of an inflationary multiverse in which the values of these constants varies from world to world. But this response strikes me as confused. The very point of the fine-tuning argument is that the observed values of those constants and quantities are not fixed by the laws of nature. So we want to know why they all fall within the narrow life-permitting range. Maudlin is not really denying that the observed constants and quantities are fine-tuned for our existence. Rather, he's championing a multiverse hypothesis with an observer self-selection effect as the best explanation of the observed fine-tuning. But then he owes us some response to the Boltmann brain problem that I shared yesterday. Uh, Maudlin also offers what he admits is a completely speculative sketch of a way of explaining fine-tuning, not by chance, but by physical necessity. And the problem here is that we have absolutely no reason to think that such a sketch is true. The multiplicity and variety of the constants and quantities that have to be fine-tuned is so uh, great that it's extremely unlikely they will turn out to be all physically necessary. So, as with the Kalam cosmological argument, I don't think that Tim has given us any good defeater of the second premise of the teleological argument. And therefore, it seems to me that the evidence of contemporary cosmology does support those premises in successful arguments of natural theology. Thanks. It's great to be back here bright and early. I'm even prouder of all the folks who are here uh, early in the morning uh, than I was already proud of you last night. Uh, I think that much of what Dr. Craig just said amounts to very similar things that were said yesterday. I don't want to spend time yet again uh, repeating the arguments there. I just do want to make one point because the single comment I got uh, besides, you know, friendly uh, uh, thank yous and so forth, after last night's event was, we really wish you guys had explained what a Boltzmann brain was. So maybe I can take 30 seconds and explain what this is. That might be, you know, an actual uh, educational moment here. The idea is that we are right now, according to the best theories of modern cosmology, evolving toward a state where the universe will live forever, but it'll be empty space. The universe is expanding, accelerating, and all the galaxies are gonna fly away. Our galaxy will evaporate into radiation and there'll be nothing left but empty space. But according to Stephen Hawking and Gary Gibbons, even empty space has quantum mechanical fluctuations. So we have a future of our universe that will last forever, but it's not completely quiet. There are bubbling virtual particles appearing and disappearing. So if you wait long enough, all sorts of things will fluctuate into existence. Atoms, molecules, viruses, people, observers, solar systems, galaxies, and so forth. Most of the conscious observers in the future of the universe under this telling will be individual brains, because you don't even need a body to be an observer, but individual brains that just randomly appear as quantum fluctuations long enough to look around and go, ha, huh, empty space, thermal equilibrium, and then die. And the argument is that if your cosmology predicts that most universes are like that, your cosmology is not very good. And I, I actually agree with that argument. I tried to say on multiple occasions last night, it is easy to avoid that conclusion. This is not a necessary conclusion. All you need to do, for example, is have our future universe not last forever with exactly the same conditions. And this is a generic prediction of the particular models that we look at. 
So individual cosmological models play a game of balancing the number of random observers, Boltzmann brains, versus the number of ordinary observers that arise after the Big Bang. And it's not at all difficult to find models that don't have a Boltzmann brain problem. So that whole discussion is a red herring in this issue. Given that, I want to actually turn to what Tim Mullen was just talking about because I, I think it's really important what he's been saying. And I agree with 98% of what he said in his talk, which never happens when I listen to anyone else give a talk about anything. Uh, I actually disagree a little bit with what Dr. Craig's point of view was about what our topic is, because I agree with Tim that our topic is a little bit bigger than we're admitting in public. The reason why, it is true that on the view graph it says God and cosmology on the slide, but the reason why we're talking about God and cosmology does ultimately come down to these questions of meaning, morality, purpose, and so far. Just as I said last night that theism needs to be connected to science. I also think that science, that theism and science need to be connected to these bigger issues of morality and meaning that Tim brought up. And I agree with Tim that even if we knew that there was a designer who created our universe, no necessary moral implications would follow from that right away. I think that those arguments are quite solid. I am less convinced than Tim is that there are objective moral values out there to be found. And, but like Tim, it doesn't really bother me, even if there weren't. I think that what matters is how we act as human beings. If I act in a moral way because I feel it is moral, even if I recognize that other people might feel other ways, I think that most human beings do share common moral intuitions. I think there's a place for rationality and reflection and ethical philosophy. And I think that the switch from a, a worldview where moral guidance is handed down or given to us from something external to one in which we are create, creators of our ultimate moral guidelines is not really a scary one. I an, analogize it to you know, looking at a, a, a a painter with a blank canvas in front of him, and you can imagine the painter saying, how do you expect me to put a painting up here? There are no lines with numbers saying where the colors should go. But great art does not actually come from painting by the numbers. It comes from fundamentally creative activity. Thank you. So let me, let me respond a bit, especially to Dr. Craig. Um, because what happened here, I should explain what happened and then draw your attention to something. Um, I wrote a paper, right? It's, it's really here. It's written. I had intended to read it. People say, oh, it's boring. People read papers. I said, I wrote it to read it. It's got great lines in it. You didn't hear that paper. It's the, a lot of the content's the same. Some of the content I skipped over. I was up this morning early couldn't sleep, and I thought, I, I want to speak to the people who come and try and speak to their deep concerns. And I honestly don't think the deep concerns of anybody here is Boltzmann brains. If there's a single person in this audience who says, my views about the God and the nature of the universe will change if only the Boltzmann brain issue comes out some other way, congratulations, you know, if you're that honest, I doubt it. So I thought, I have this opportunity, I should make use of it in the best way I think is possible. Now, what I've been told is that's a red herring. A red herring. The actual situation is this. I came here, as I said, the way philosophy is done is by a dialogue, by listening, by responding. Dr. Craig wrote responses to what I had written and sent him and read them, including responses to arguments I didn't even give you. Why? Not to enlighten you. You couldn't understand what he was saying. There's an argument he responded to. I never said it. He could have listened to what I was saying and try and think and respond to it. The game, this forensic game of debate is not the way to find the truth which is what I started telling you, and it was illustrated by that. It's just a game. Now, you may have your beliefs so fixed 
that no argument will shake you out of them, no matter what. Most people are like that. It's hard not to be like that. It's very hard to be open to an honest investigation of the world and to put your most deeply held beliefs on the line. But I just didn't see any reason to get up here and pretend that's not what really is important to us. Because I think that is what's really important. And one thing that's scary a bit about the world today is that for very bad reasons, good scientific research, and next year you're going to talk about climate change, which is a perfect example, stellar scientific research is opposed and derided for non-scientific reasons. Just as the research telling us that smoking causes cancer was derided and attacked by tobacco industry. They had their reasons. They were not scientific reasons. They had their reasons not for, you want to, not for people not to believe that smoking was bad for you. It was part of their bottom line. There are reasons why the coal industry does not want you to understand that the climate is changing and the, effect, and, and the causes of that because it affects their bottom line. And there's a difference between reasoning. I mean, the main thing I want to get across here is the deep difference between reasoning and rationalization. Honest reasoning is a case where you don't know in the beginning what the right answer is, and you're following the best evidence and the best arguments you can find. Rationalization is when you've decided the answer at the beginning, and you're just seeking around to find any little bit of thing that looks like an argument that comes to the conclusion you've already settled. Now, it may be many of you feel you are in a position where you can only rationalize, that you have certain beliefs you cannot, literally will not, allow to come into question in your mind. And that's a good thing, at least to realize it, but then don't pretend that you're reasoning when you're rationalizing. And I think that's unfortunately what, what goes on. So uh, again, I, the, the technical issues about these theorems and so on. I mean, if you're interested, if you're really interested in the BGC, BGV theorem, send me an email. I'll tell you what's wrong with it. But that's not why you're here. And I've, I've tried to speak to why I think, I think we are here. Thank you. Thank you.